afternoon, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Mon nom est Patrice Albanese, pre uh, président de la Fédération des sciences humaines. On behalf of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, I'm delighted to welcome you to the fourth event of our flag flagship Big Thinking series at this 88th Congress of the Humanities and Social Sciences. I would like to take this opportunity to say how grateful we are to members of the Musqueam community for, their, uh, for generously allowing us to meet on their territory each day during Congress at the President's reception. With a gathering of this scope, it's not possible for Musqueam elders to be at all Congress events, so we're especially thankful that they've taken the time to uh, attend so many uh, uh, events already. We would like to acknowledge that the Vancouver campus of the University of British Columbia, where we gather for Congress 2019, is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Our gratitude extends to the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations for hosting Congress attendees on their unceded territories. J'aimerais signaler avant de commencer que nous proposons un service d'interprétation simultanée. Vous pourrez vous uh, procurer uh, des écouteurs uh, dans la salle située à l'extérieur du théâtre. We're enormously grateful for all the hard work leading up to this week undertaken by our, by our Congress hosts and partner in the Big Thinking series, the University of British Columbia. It's been our distinct pleasure to collaborate with UBC on presenting this series, which showcases the contributions that art and artists make to society. Uh, je souhaite remercier le Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines et la Fondation Can uh, canadienne d'innovation uh, pour le uh, parrainage de la série Causerie Voix Grande. It is thanks to the gen uh, generosity of these sponsors that we're able to open up these events to the public for all to enjoy. It would also, uh, I'd also like uh, to note that our Big Thinking series are videotaped and you're able to view the lectures later after, um, after the event on the Congress website. The Big Thinking series gives us a chance to engage in thoughtful exchanges about critical issues of our time. And this afternoon is no exception. It is our great honor to welcome four award-winning performers, writers, and directors to this stage. Sil uh, Sylvia Clotier, Margot Kane, Corey Payette, and Lindsay uh, Lachance are all prominent in Indigenous theater in this country. They will grace our stage with a mix of per, uh, performances, individual reflections, and a panel discussion. It is my pleasure uh, now to present Ursula Gobel, uh, Associate Vice President of Future Skills Challenges at the Social Science and Humanities Research Council. Ursula first joined SHRC in 2007 as Director of Communications. For the first five years, she has worked in her current role to advance uh, the ability of the social sciences and humanities to meet so, uh, society's future challenges and opportunities. She'll be here to today to tell us a bit more about how the idea behind this event aligns very well with the matters that Shirk uh, and our community um, uh, value. Ursula will also introduce you to our moderator, Lindsay Lachance. Thank you. Merci, Patricia. Thank you so much. Um, it is, uh, alors, bon après-midi, tout le monde. Uh, bonjour à tous et toutes. I would also like to acknowledge the, the land that we are gathered today on is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. It is truly an honor for me to be your guest today. And a great thank you to UBC and the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences for hosting and organizing a tremendous Congress in 2019. It has been a, an incredible experience for all of us, certainly, and on behalf of SHRC, we are also uh, very, very grateful. Thank you. It is, uh, as I mentioned, a true honor and a great pleasure to introduce this big thinking session on storytelling and strength, voices from Indigenous theater in Canada. Indigenous theater continues to break down barriers by providing a powerful platform for Indigenous peoples to raise their voices and to bring to us to the forefront the stories and the issues that matter most. Through Indigenous theater, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples showcase their stories to a broad audience and are empowered 
to craft the message on their own terms and honor their own creative voices. As such, Indigenous theater is a critical tool in the resurgence and reclaiming of Indigenous narratives. As you may be aware, SHRC, in collaboration with the other granting agencies, has been leading an initiative entitled Strengthening Indigenous Research Capacity for the past year. We have worked very closely with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities and organizations in hosting events across the country. These included roundtables and workshops. And they provided an opportunity, certainly from a granting agency perspective, to really listen to a diversity of voices that included elders and knowledge keepers, youth and students, researchers, business leaders, women's groups, and community research organizations. In addition to these engagement events, we launched a dedicated funding opportunity for multidisciplinary Indigenous research and reconciliation grants. They were launched on June 21st, National Indigenous Peoples Day last year. And these grants supported community gatherings, workshops, and events that mobilized and exchanged knowledge on Indigenous research and reconciliation. We had anticipated hosting 50 grants, or, or supporting 50 grants, rather, and we supported close to 120. And the majority of these grants were awarded to Indigenous communities and organizations. In fact, 85% of proposals by Indigenous organizations and communities were successful. Through this engagement with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, storytelling featured very prominently as an important vehicle to communicate personal and shared experiences. And their voices continue to guide us and in our work and pave the way towards the decolonization of research and foremost towards the self-determination of First Nations, Métis, Inuit peoples to set their research agenda and lead Indigenous research. So now it is a great pleasure to introduce the moderator of this session, uh, Dr. Lindsay Lachance, the Artistic Associate uh, Director for Indigenous Theatre at the National Arts Centre. Lindsay is an Algonquin Anishinaabe with a PhD in theatre from UBC. Lindsay has recently collaborated with Jerry Longboat on one of those research and reconciliation grants that I mentioned titled Decolonization Within the Performing Arts, Mobilizing Knowledge and in of Indigenous Practices in Creation and Performance and Equitable Collaborations Between Indigenous and Settler-Led Organizations and Artists. Lindsay has been fascinated with theater from a young age, and she is now active not only in dramaturgy, but also in developing and teaching courses in indigenous and theater studies. Please join me in giving Lindsay a warm welcome and to who will be introducing our speakers today. so much for joining us here today and thank you to the organizers of Big Thinking in Congress for inviting us to be here with all of you this afternoon. My name is Lindsay Lachance and I'm from an Algonquin Anishinaabe and mixed Canadian family and I'm currently the Artistic Associate of Indigenous Theatre at the National Arts Centre. I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people as a recent graduate of UBC, upon completing my uh, dissertation here, I've had the honor of living and working on these territories for over five years. And being able to work here at UBC, I have been truly impacted and transformed by the amazing scenery, by the weather, by the relationships that I've made while being here. And for that, I'm forever grateful. So miigwech to Muskegon. Um, we're so excited to be here today. I feel truly honored to be gathered with some amazing trailblazers, some artistic leaders that have really helped to influence not only the world of Canadian theatre, but specifically to help create and form Indigenous theatre within this country and nationally as well. I would like to have you guys introduce yourselves and maybe speak to us a little bit about how you see yourself as an Indigenous storyteller. Mm -hmm. I think I'll begin with a song Ooh. today. I'm Margot Kane. I'm Cree Soto from Alberta. 
uh, living here in Vancouver for uh, quite, a, quite a long time. And um, I'm the artistic managing director of Full Circle First Nations Performance, a company I formed in 92 because I wanted to gather my fellow indigenous artists and story makers and storytellers and creative people. I wanted to gather them to work with and to talk with and to train with and to create uh, some work. And I found that uh, it was a long journey <laughs> creating a company when there was only a handful of us uh, that we could find in Vancouver at that time. In fact, when I first came to Vancouver, um, I went looking for the artists and uh, I found carvers. So I met some really wonderful people. I met Bo and Simon Dick and I, I met Joe David and I met, you know, any number of artists in, in the, in the, uh, from the BC region in Vancouver. And from there we began to uh, develop more and more conversations among ourselves. But I traveled back to Alberta three to four times a year because it is my home territory. And I was very fortunate to be born when I was born. There were times in my life when I'm sure I, I thought otherwise. <laughs> but as, as I'm older now and I think back of the, the time that I had, uh, the time that we had uh, connected to the territory that we lived in, the land, nature, um, the freedom that I had as an eldest child to run about in the woods and the creeks and the bushes and to really uh, connect in a way that really brings me a lot of solace now that I'm older. I find that um, I look back fondly on those times and remember how precious those years were. Uh, because now, of course, we live in big cities and there's all kinds of things that interfere with our connection to our territories and to our land and to our sense of self, which I really was not aware of that I was developing a very strong connection or had a very strong connection to the territory, the land, the waters, the rivers, the creeks, the trees, the animals, the insects, um, the, the, uh, the way of life that I had just as a simple child exploring nature. So I want to sing this song. I'm uh, Cree Métis. Uh, my peoples are actually uh, settled in northeast of uh, Edmonton, up in uh, Elk Point, Smoky Lake, all of the, those territories up there. And um, we have, um, I have been uh, certainly um, um, <laughs> welcomed by all kinds of uh, indigenous peoples as I've traveled. And this is one song that uh, was taught to me very early on. It's a Cree morning song. I really want to say that as much as uh, I've been doing this work for a long time, um, I always uh, have been thinking back. I'm of an age right now, so I'm thinking back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing on a little knoll looking uh, at my, uh, the future and looking behind me to see where I've traveled. And uh, it's, a very, it's, a very, um, it's a really beautiful place, actually because you can see uh, the journey you've come and 
you can, uh, you're kind of removed from all the trauma of, <laughs> of the challenges that you had. And uh, as I'm thinking about and planning uh, the last third or quarter of my life, I don't know how much left I've, time I've got, um, I'm willing to accept that um, I have still things to do that I have not been able to achieve yet, uh, things artistically. So when I began, I was very much a storyteller. I was always a child who was uh, always uh, listening to the radio or watching TV when I, we got a little older. We got a TV when I was nine. And so um, we always, you know, we were raised with dominant culture kind of stories and ways of telling story and songs and all that. And I, I just picked it up. I'm a good mimic, so I could, uh, I could, uh, I memorized all the songs on the radio, and I love to entertain my brothers and sisters. And uh, I like to sing, and I like to dance, and I like to tell stories to them. And they were my captive audience, so I, <laughs> I had plenty of practice. Um, I think probably um, um, I would say that um, my own my own connection to my own indigenous sense of who I was was formed very early because I was adopted and I was the only Indian in the family. I was the only Indian in the neighborhood. Uh, there was a black family that was you know, several blocks away. Uh, you know, there was just a handful of us. But I, I, I had at an early age, I had my relatives would come and visit me and they would take me away on weekends and things. So I, I stayed very connected to who I was as an indigenous person, but I was alone a long time. And I, I think being an eldest child, that was fine because I really was, um, I had my own path that I was finding. Uh, I, I, tra I used to wander out into the, into the nature and uh, lose myself in, in nature. And I used to uh, spend a lot of time exploring paths not taken. It was kind of natural for me to do that. I, I think probably um, I w it, it helped that I was a smart student too because then I got a lot of encouragement from my teachers. And so I have really good uh, experience in school because the teachers really supported me and nurtured me and encouraged me. I think probably um, um, it, it wasn't until I had left high school, you know, singing and dancing and drama class and musicals and the big band and all that. It wasn't until I was out of school that I really um, began to pursue the performing arts as a career and I began to question what kind of stories were, were I going to, was I going to participate in. As an actor, you participate in everything. You're a player. You, it's assumed that you will play every character, but of course, you know, we discovered that, of course, brown people um, in the acting field were, you know, always relegated to the maids and the secondary, secondary uh, uh, players. That, that whole kind of history uh, meant that I, I, it didn't bother me particularly, but I was already carving out my own connection to my own cultural um, stories and my own cultural people in my territory. And I, I found my way um, looking, for, um, looking for plays about indigenous people like there were none. Uh, the Ecstasy of Rita Jo. When the Ecstasy of Rita Jo came into my territory at the Citadel, the new big Citadel Regional Theater in Edmonton, uh, the role of Rita Jo went to a white woman. And uh, I was the understudy. Oh. <laughs> I was offended, but I was also, um, I, I was also determined, so I, I understudied that role. I played Eileen Joe. I got the final word in the play. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and I got the big review. Um, it was unfortunate um, <laughs> because of that big review, <laughs> asking why that white woman was playing that role and doing such a lousy accent. You know, I <laughs> that meant that I couldn't get to even play the understudy role even for one performance. Mm. But I think, um, the, you know, my whole early career was very much about that. And so I, I began to actually think about creating my own stories, the, stories that um, meant something to me and my people, meant something to my relatives, because there was nothing on the stages in Canada except for the ecstasy of Rita Joe. And I suppose um, it took many years. It took a long time. Um, I'm, very, um, I'm very, you know, excited by the future because, of course, uh, establishing a full circle in 92, even though it was a slow, it's been a slow build, we developed the Talking Stick Festival so that we could bring people together. They could share a stage, all kinds of, a multidisciplinary festival. 
Um, you, you know, we presented any work that need, wanted to stage. And for me, it, it, it's a couple of things. One, it was because it, uh, resource-wise, we didn't have enough financial resources. We didn't have enough human resources. So let's pool our energy and come together and do a festival and, and offer those opportunities for us to work together and show our work together and be supported. And for me, I mean, part of that is just um, my own desire to keep pulling the community together because I'm trying, been trying to pull my family together. To me, they're my family in the arts and, and indigenous uh, workers and artists and helpers and allies. They're my family and I, I need to keep pulling them together so that I could sense my, my own family. And I think that after, uh, now the Talking Sick Festival is just uh, completed its 19th year. Um, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we're kind of moving into a, a, another time when we realize, of course, we're trying to, we're trying to solve a number of issues. Um, we're trying to create some more producers that can produce more work because I can't keep doing everything. <laughs> I'm getting tired. And I still, as I said at the top, I really have some creative work I still haven't done and I want to do. Um, when I created my solo piece, Moon Lodge, it was an opportunity for me to tour for you know over 10 years all over the place. Uh, a chance for me to take my work into smaller communities, uh, into rural communities. Uh, to, um, to international communities, it was still I was still at the you know at the forefront. There was not many opportunities for me as an actor on stage. There were a number on TV film. I did a number of TV things. I did a couple of film things. I wasn't really interested in that field. I wasn't interested in the business of being a, a, a television or film actor. I was interested in creating work that had meaning. I was interested in creating a place where we could all. Um, work together, talk together, share together, create together, uh, change the world together. So I'm, I'm, really, <laughs> I'm really standing on my little knoll here. Um, I'm looking around thinking, yeah, I had a pretty good life, but gee, I've still got a few more things to do. I've got to roll up my sleeves and, <laughs> and make sure that everybody else takes care of the festival so I can actually jump into uh, some creative waters. So I'll just leave it there for the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Sylvia Nguyenga. I'm from Kuchuak. Kuchuak is in Nunavik, which is in the Arctic part of Quebec. Um, I also spent over 20 years in Iqaluit Nunavut, um, where I made it home there. I am an artist in uh, different ways. I'm also a mother of two boys. Um, yeah. I uh, am currently going to the National Theatre School of, um, of Canada in Montreal. Uh, I'm one of the Indigenous artists in residency. And um, later on in my life, I decided to pursue my education. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I guess there's so much to talk about, or I don't really know where to start. Um, I'm very humbled to be here. Um, there are many, um, there are many Inuit in the world, uh, not as many as uh, a lot of people in the world, but um, our land is very big. Uh, we come from Greenland, Canada, Alaska, and uh, Russia, and so our land is huge, and it's only normal that our language uh, changes and our uh, music changes and our traditions change. Um, and I would say for the last uh, 25 years of being a performer, um, I've learned a lot about Inuit culture. I've learned a lot about um, how Inuit traditions change, musical traditions change. Um, I even... Um, also, the... Um, the generations and how um, how we've passed down our traditions um, are a little bit different, but um, I can only speak <laughs> from my own experiences. Obviously, um, in 
I'm, uh, I'm of a generation, a, a younger generation, that um, learned a lot of my musical traditions and, and storytelling traditions, um, not so much from my mother's generation, but from the older generation. Um, I am uh, the daughter of somebody who went to residential school. So it's very common where I come from, where the generation of my mother's generation sort of skipped um, the passing down of a lot of our musical traditions, um, a lot of our storytelling, because they were sent away, you know, my mother was sent away at 10 years old until she, and she only returned at 18. Um, so th this is the age where you usually uh, learn a lot about, um, you know, skill building uh, when it comes to like sewing and also bonding with your family. Um, and for us in our Inuit culture, when you share stories, we're allowed to yawn. <laughs> it's not rude to yawn because it's, it's actually a good sign. It means you're relaxed and you're listening. Aww. And it's really normal. We, we, uh, traditionally, Inuit lived in very small, quaint, comfortable spaces. And the young generation would listen to these stories that the adults would tell. And um, in, in my family lineage, um, we have a very strong uh, throat singing tradition called katatja. And we imitate the sounds of the environment. We imitate the birds and like the saw that we use in the snow, um, the river uh, melting, the river ice melting into water, um, the dog running and, and, you know, and the little puppy uh, running in the snow and crunching in the snow mm -hmm. and you can hear his breath and then he falls and he slips and you know we imitate these beautiful little sounds that um, when you go out camping you close your eyes and you you know these sounds are alive and um, we're very connected um, and we are very meant to be connected with nature and we're very um, we are one with nature uh, nature isn't in our backyard um, we are we are as important as the animals, as a, and most of us don't have trees. And I'm really uh, amazed at how big the trees are here in Vancouver. <laughs> um, but you know, we're very connected to wildlife, and and we're very connected to um, mentoring is really important in our culture. You know, um, prior to colonization. Um, in a small, in a small camp, we all took care of each other, and we all took on the role of um, of being each other's um, caregiver, uh, looking out for each other's health and looking out for each other's um, well being, and and also, you know, telling stories to young people and telling stories to each other came through bonding and came through uh, song sometimes. And um, these, this bonding was, you know, was everything, was very, was so important. I mean, it's what, it's what um, gives you confidence as a human being and allows you to grow and um, feel, um, feel purposeful and, and, and you have to imagine that when Inuit lived together prior to colonization and, and before they, they lived in settlements, it was very intimate. It was very, you know, there was no room to pretend to be something else. <laughs> um, it was very intimate. And so um, these stories, we have a really important uh, tradition of telling stories orally. We never had a writing system ever until the missionaries came. Um, and I can only speak for what happened in Canada, but in, uh, the missionaries, when they came, they wanted to obviously convert Inuit into Christianity. And the only way they could do that was if they created a writing system to translate the Bible in Inuktitut, in Inuktitut um, so that Inuit could read the Bible and, um, and go to church. And, and change their spiritual beliefs. Um, 
So our spiritual beliefs come from um, shamanism. It comes from um, truly believing that there is a boss of the sea, that there is a woman that is in the, in the, in the um, I can even tell you the story, actually, um, uh, in a nutshell. <laughs> There, there was um, there was this woman who wanted to um, didn't want to marry, and um, her father really wanted her to marry so that she could um, one day have somebody to provide for her. And sometimes in the old days, uh, we don't have stores, right? We don't have. Uh, uh, farms or anything like that. Everything is counted on hunting. And so sometimes hunting conditions are, are rough. Sometimes there, there, are, there are no animals in certain areas. And so um, this woman, uh, this young woman, um, turned down many um, suitors um, because she wanted to remain in the community where, where her, she was with her father. And, um, and her father um, insisted that she marry someone. And this man came into their camp. And he was this incredible provider. He came with a hamutik full of caribou and, and uh, ahikik. Uh, ptarmigans and all this food in a time where they really needed to eat. And so he really uh, made an impression on, on the family and in the community. And so she decided to, um, to well, we, don't, we didn't have marriage the way marriage is now, but um, form a union. <laughs> and so um, she, uh, she went out um, when the season changed. Her husband wanted her to live in her camp, so he, uh, he asked her to uh, come along. And once the, um, the sea froze up again, they walked across and they went to another, uh, another camp together. And Nuleayuk, um, this young woman, uh, longed for home, but she had accepted that she had a new life. And, um, and it was with this man. And so she put her guard down, um, and he provided for her. And one day, she decided to follow him when he ventured out hunting. He was such a good hunter. And it was really amazing how, how well he hunted. So she wanted to kind of spy on him. And she followed him out. And then she saw him transform into a bird. And when he transformed into a bird, everything came to mind where, of course, she knew. Of course, he was a great hunter. He had the best view of all the land. He had the best view of the water. He had the best view of all the animals that are around. So of course, he was a great hunter. And so she ran back to camp, and she took a um, seal and she blew her seal up. It's this uh, seal that all the, um, it's cut in a certain way where all the meat is extracted and you tie one end and you blow it up and it becomes like a floating device for when you go uh, whale hunting, you attach it to a harpoon. And so she took this avata, it's called avata, and she swam. And she swam, and she, she really was um, trying to escape from this man that she thought was a man, but wasn't a man. <laughs> and uh, when she escaped from him, she was swimming, and she saw her father on a hayak. And he took her, and he threw her on the hayak, and she laid there. She laid across, not in the kayak, but she laid across on it. She held on to, on the, on the boat. And the bird arrived and wanted to take her away, of course, because he wants to take his wife home. And the father refused. So the father took his daughter and threw her 
in the water and said, you will never get my daughter. You will never get my daughter. So he, in an effort to save her, threw her in the water. And she grabbed onto the edge of the haya. And she um, tried to try not to drown, of course. And her father took his knife and cut her fingers. And she sank to the bottom of the sea. And as she sank to the bottom of the sea, all her fingers turned into the whales and the fish and the seals and all the animals in the sea. And so today, she's still there in the bottom of the sea. And she has this long, beautiful hair that gets tangled once in a while because she has no fingers <laughs> to comb her own hair. So she gets irritated sometimes, especially when her hair gets caught with these water bottles and these you know, plastic bags and all this like garbage, right? And if somebody throws something over water, well, it's going to get caught in her hair. So Inuit would, would ask the shaman in their community, in their camp, to do something. And the shaman would communicate and spiritually travel to, into the sea to soothe Nuleayuk, to help her comb her hair. And the sea animals would also come and help comb her hair. So the more irritated she was, the less animals she would release for the hunters to catch. And this is old Inuit spirituality. This is the spirituality. Um, these were our, our beliefs before Christianity came to the north. And it's very humbling. It teaches you that when you go out hunting, you can be the best hunter in the world, but it doesn't matter. The, uh, the, the, the weather is the boss. The sea is the boss. Um, the animals will come to you um, when you need them, and sometimes not, e not even when you need them. It's a, it's a very humbling uh, place to be out on the land. And a lot of our stories that we share with our children, um, for example, the Northern Lights, we're all told when we're little kids, um, when you whistle to them, They dance for you. And you can have fun and you can whistle to them. And you can even play with them by rubbing your knuckles together. My mother would say that when zippers came, when zippers came along, that kids would play with their zippers, <laughs> right? But then if you tease them too much, they come down and they cut your head off and they play ball with it. <laughs> And so when you're a kid and you're out playing in the dark, you know that you're not alone. <laughs> so there's a lot of these beautiful stories that we share with our kids. And yeah, they scare our kids, but we're teaching them, <laughs> but we're teaching them to deal with fear, right? We're also teaching them to be aware of their surroundings. And that also creates confidence. You know, you can't change the environment but you can change your attitude in the environment. And so I'm very inspired by these stories. Um, I've spent um, my adult years, I mean, as a kid, I used to ask my grandmother all the time, can you tell me this? Can you tell me that? Can you kid my, my grandmother was a very musical, um, she was very open. We had, a, we had a really nice bond that was different from her and my, and my mother. Um, or she told me the summer before she died that I was named after, I am named after her grandmother. And her grandmother used to sing, throat sing. And that's why I sing, because I am a little bit of an oddball in my family <laughs> when it comes to arts. I'm, I'm really the only artist in my family of um, people in aviation and politics. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I'm very inspired by our stories, and I think that they can teach us a lot. I think that also um, that
the hunter in our culture is like, we come from a hunting culture and a hunter's job is so important to us. You know, we can have stores and we can have an abundance of food in our store. But if we don't eat our traditional food, that, that gives us a lot of nourishment and that really agrees with our body, we're not going to feel well. We're not going to do well. And um, we need it. There's no doubt we need it. And Vancouver, you have amazing salmon, by the way. <laughs> um, but we, we need to, um, we have so much to learn from our hunters. And I, I, love, um, I love incorporating um, what we can learn from our hunters in storytelling. And theater is actually a very, very modern space. Um, for us as, um, I can't say for us as Indigenous people, but um, as Inuit, you know, throat singing would happen at home and it was very intimate. And the way it was performed was like with your sister or with your, um, with your, with your aunt or your mother or your grandmother and you would sing and then the little kids would like fall asleep and listen to it. And, um, and when you felt comfortable to, and when you were a kid and you felt comfortable to like copy the older women singing, then you would sing. And then when you got comfortable to come and sing with them, you would come and sing with them. There was no like particular order of, um, uh, of how you learn. It was just a very organic, natural way of learning, like mentoring. And it's the same with hunting. Um, a boy would follow their hunter, and not just boys, girls too, would follow a hunter out on the land and learn after the, uh, learn after the hunters. And when they were confident enough themselves, they would try and, and they would, um, today we use guns a lot. So it, it's all about like building confidence, sharing and building confidence. And today, um, what makes my work as a theater maker um, or a storyteller, singer, I really love working with young people. And I really love creating safe spaces for expression. Um, expression is so important. It's so important to feel like you have a voice. And it's so important to. Um, for young people to feel like their voices are heard. And I love the idea of theater because it's so inclusive. It can include the girls who love to throat sing. It could include the boys who do Inuit games. It can include the, the ones that want to learn drum dancing and Inotitu, and they, they love their language and they want to share it with other people. And it, it can include um, these amazing seamstresses in our culture. And so it's very inclusive that way, and it's all about expressing ourselves. And so that's, I think that that's, I'll end it on that note. I think that that's the most important. <laughs> Anin Korin Dishnikas. My name is Corey Payette. My, uh, my father's from the Matagami First Nations in Northern Ontario, and uh, I have uh, this OG Cree territory. Um, and I have been living in Vancouver on the unceded Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil the First Nations uh, for the last 10 years. I consider this home now. Um, I'm the artistic director of Urban Inc. Productions were, uh, uh, oh, people know the, okay, great. Right? Uh, <laughs> hi, hi. Uh, and, um, and so I've been the artistic director there for five years. I'm going to my sixth season. Um, it's a company that's, that was founded by Metis artist uh, Marie Clements uh, in 2001. Uh, and it's an indigenous and culturally diverse theater company. Uh, we create work from the seat of an idea through to full main stage productions, and then we tour them uh, uh, from you know uh, going onto a reserve in a community hall to the National Arts Center main stage. Um, 
and and all around the world. We've done we've done international tours as well. Um, I think that the way that I I grew up and uh, my work as an artist uh, really has been has been shaped by um, the reclamation of my indigenous self. Uh, I came from a family that was, uh, had a lot of shame about uh, their indigenous culture. Um, my, uh, this is, you know, uh, my grandmother, who uh, is the, my, the indigenous side of my family, passed away a couple months ago. And, you know, she was telling me oh, over the last two years, we've had a lot of time to talk about where, the, where that uh, the, sort of the train went off the tracks. Um, and it really was her, it was her and my father. Um, but, but her mother actually spoke uh, her indigenous language as her first language. And so it's like, it doesn't feel that far away. And I think that, you know, now having gone back to um, my, my family's territory many times, it's like every time I get back there and every time we speak the language, oh, hi, uh, every time we speak the language and every time we learn the worldview, it's like I get closer and closer to connecting to those ancestors that, that through the process of colonization of my family and of my experience growing up has felt like it doesn't belong to me or that, or that that's an, I don't have a place there. And I think that in all of the work that I do as an artist, I, I am constantly trying to challenge that and to say that and to welcome other artists who are feeling the same way to say that that is a part of you. That is, that is who you are and you have the right to that. Um, and, and so that has been a part of everything that I've done. So it has to do with language. It has to do including indigenous language. Every single show that, I, that I've done um, uh, has included uh, efforts to revitalize indigenous language. I, I started as a, as a musical theater actress. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I did that for many years as, as an actor. And, um, and that was a lot of fun. And then I was like, I don't want to do it again. Uh, and, so, and so then I started writing. And, and, and I think a big frustration that came from it was honestly just that, like what, like what Margot was saying, uh, is that there were no roles for me. You know, I didn't have any way to, to, um, to express myself as a storyteller, really, unless it was like as chorus member number two in whatever, like casual uh, and so And so I think that in order for those stories to be there, in order for me to, to be able to, not that I'm an actor now, but to create those stories for other people, I had to do that myself. So I, I uh, started writing musicals uh, when I was young, and over the last few years, uh, well, it took me seven years to write, uh, a musical called Children of God that has been, uh, you know, touring all around. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, but, but Children of God, it was really like I grew up. That I grew up with that show. I didn't know how to write before I wrote that show, and then it's like as I wrote it, I uh, people took me under their wing. Like, oh my god, like you know. I, I'm sitting here next to Margot. It's like Margot is, you know, she has been my teacher. She talks about her teachers. It's like she has been the person who took me under her wing. And, you know, I have to say, coming to Vancouver and, and really being this, like, young uh, uh, digi queer kid, because uh, I was young when we first met. Like, it was, like, really early in my time in Vancouver. If I hadn't had Margot to pull me in, you know, and to say, like, you have a place here, I don't know if I would be sitting here. Um, so, it really is, and so I try, I try to, to, to kind of pay that forward in every young artist that I meet and in every person uh, that I audition and who comes to me and says, like, I don't feel like I have a right to this. I don't feel like I have a place in these stories. And I'm like, you do. I promise you, you do. Uh, even if it's articulating that, even if it's articulating, articulating the complexity of the contemporary Indigenous experience, you have a place. Um, and so every show that I've done uh, with Children of God and Les Filles du Roi and now uh, Sedna, the, the story that, that uh, Sui was talking about, we have a show this next season uh, that's going up at the Vancouver Playhouse uh, in January. No one knows about this yet, so let's keep it in the room. <laughs> on the line. 
<laughs> I'm totally not allowed to say that, but whatever, it's going to city council. It'll go, we'll hope, hopefully it gets passed. Anyway, uh, and so that's coming up. But, um, but all these shows have different forms of, of reclaiming that culture, reclaiming our language, and of, and of saying that just because the stories that we've been told have positioned us in a certain way doesn't mean that those are the stories that we have to keep telling. Uh, and so I think that's, that's where I'll leave it. Miigwech, thanks for having me. We have about five minutes before we take a mini break. Um, so before we do that, maybe, Margot, you can speak a little bit to some of the mentorship and some of the opportunity that folks have had through the Full Circle First Nations Ensemble. I know both Corey and I have had amazing experiences working and training with you, and I echo his sentiment 100%. Um, and it would just be awesome to hear a little bit more about some of those training um, initiatives that Full Circle has offered over the past 20 or so years. I, I, um, as I said, I, um, as an eldest child, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm an actor. I like, you know, I'd like to have the center of attention. I'd like to, you know, share my voice on the stage, et cetera. But in my family, <laughs> I had to take care of everybody. And that was drilled into me, that I had to be responsible for my brothers and sisters and anybody else. And <laughs> that happened to be in that little circle. So I think um, part of it, part of how I developed Full Circle was really um, that I wanted to gather everyone, that I wanted to have my brothers and sisters in the circle with me. I wanted to um, make sure that we, were, that we were working together, that we could build uh, our own stories, that we could build our own uh, organizations, that we could share our stories. Because on the Canadian stages at that time, you know, I knew that the, um, that the uh, non-native the theatrical community had been rallying and fighting to have uh, Canadian plays on the stages in this country, as opposed to British and American stories. And so I thought it was a no-brainer. But it really took a long time because we have to like advocate for ourselves, and we have to, you know, people people can care about us, but we that we are the ones that really have to do that work, and so we needed to come together. It, it also was for probably, um, uh, you know, those early days as well. I was create started to create my work um, in. Uh, I started to create my work. Physically, I'm a f I like physical theater technique and anything that engages the full self. And I don't know where I got that except that I was a dancer. I was a natural mover. And, and, and so I was very concerned that I like to work with movement, dance and movement and text. And I really wasn't, I, while I enjoyed uh, you know, being an actor in a play, I didn't necessarily want to create my work according to a Western construct or a form. I wanted to find my own indigenous voice and the way that voicing um, would appear in a, in a creating a work. So my earliest work were story, stories and ritual. I did a lot of rich, ritual I, outside. I like to be outside and I like to create that. And so when I started to gather young people and other people together, it was really also for us to explore the way that we might tell our own stories from the body of who we were. Because that's all I had. I didn't have a language. I didn't have a Cree language. I didn't have a strong uh, desire at that moment. I, needed, I wanted to tell story. So I wanted to find my own voice in, in this process. So I think in the work that we, um, we did with Full Circle and that we attempted to do was to gather people. When we, we had... Um, we started uh, full circle. We just started with small uh, training sessions to work together and share our techniques. And we'd bring in different people that we knew, or that uh, non-native people as well. And we there were a number of us. So we worked together, and we just were kind of all of us. You know, I mean, Archer Pachawas was in that circle. Brenda Ledley was in that circle. Sometimes Alana Young was in that circle. Uh, Marie Clements was in that circle. You know, there was any number of us early people in those circles. And I also, I think, um, as we went along, we um, tried to create a, a training that was very much about voice. 
So we, ha we had an opportunity, and one of my colleagues, David McMurray Smith and I, we have a real, he's a real kindred spirit for me. He works in clown and, and uh, body, you know, a lot of body work. So we uh, developed a training program uh, that was not about uh, training uh, people for theater. It was about artists that came to the circle, came to the training to find their own way to express themselves, whether they were primarily a dancer or a theater artist or a singer or a combination thereof. It was um, to, for, for us as, as, as artists to find our voicing through our body, through, through the work, the kind of work that David offered, but also the sense that we were holding the circle, we had the medicine in the room, we had cultural teachers come in, we, had, we learned various, uh, you know, we learned about the, the, some of the uh, different ways, uh, cultural ways in this territory that many of us were new to. So um, I think a lot of the mentorship and the work that we developed um, through a part-time training program, then a full-time training program. It lasted a two-year training program. We just didn't have the capacity to continue it, you know. We started to integrate um, artists to mentor through uh, working in the company. And, and depending upon their interest, they were training in some marketing or they were training in some workshop delivery or they were training in box office and helping the festival get on its feet. So there was opportunity for them to work inside an arts organization as well as receiving some kind of workshop intensives. So it's always been that kind of sense that we, that we you know, for me, I feel like we're, I, we're always learning and I, I, I love to be in a room where we're actually uh, trying things and learning from each other. So that's the development of that program has morphed into different ways. And right now, we're just in, we're actually uh, training the people we have right now, just a handful uh, in producing, because we need producers. Because I can't produce forever, I'm telling you. <laughs> no more producing. <laughs> all right, we are going to take a quick break. I just want to thank all mm -hmm. three of you so much for all of your generous offers. And I think that we can all consider the importance of land, of mentorship, of revitalization of, of language and reclaiming cultural elements in all the work that you do. We're gonna take a quick five minute break because I know some folks have to go to a next session. So we can think about uh, coming back to an open Q&A where you folks are invited to ask our amazing artists some questions. So again, we can think about these themes of land, of mentorship, of cultural revitalization, and um, we'll, we'll call you back in with a song from Sylvia when we're ready to start again. Miigwech. Right, welcome back, everybody. Thank you to those of you who are able to stay with us. We just wanted to make sure there was time for folks to transition into their next sections. So we're coming back with Margot Kane, Sylvia Cloutier, and Corey Payette. And I'm just gonna pass it over to Sylvia, who is going to give us a treat. Um, there's one thing that, um, that I, you know, we're, we're artists and we always want a voice to the world and we always have a message in, in, uh, in our work. And one thing that I've really explored this year, um, is a very heavy issue that, that affects us very deeply in the North is the incredibly high suicide rate among our young people, among young Inuit. It's, it's devastating. It's really an epidemic right now. And, um, and it's really high and it's really difficult to live with. I mean, I don't know, every few days, you know, I, I, I hear about a suicide and when I look on Facebook or when I, you know, you're talking to someone and it's just, it's so sad and it's so hard to deal with. And I know that there's, um, you know, I, if I had a long time to talk about it, we would, we would definitely have uh, more understanding of why it's happened, but that's the thing with suicide is we're left wondering why every single time. And every time we hear about losing somebody, we, we revisit who we've lost, you know, and it's just, um, we have a real lack of mental health uh, services in the north. And in, in, my, in the region that I come from, in Nunavik, just last year, uh, we lost 12 people to suicide. Nine of those 12 were from one community in Puvilnituk 
including an 11-year-old, you know? And, and when I live in Montreal and I talk about it, it's as if in Montreal, 17,000 people would die in one year from suicide. You know, it's, it's intense. And it's very real. And unfortunately, um, it's happening. So uh, this is part of our country, and these are our realities. So the work that I do, I really want to um, continue working with young people and giving them a space or creating a space, a safe space for them to express themselves. And it's something that I've been doing for over 20 years, but it's also what a lot of people are, are trying to do themselves without relying too much on government or, you know, like it's something that we need to do at school. It's, it's, we just need to create more safe spaces for expression. So I'd like to, um, I was wondering what I was going to sing, and now I know what I want to sing for you. It's a song that I wrote um, quite a while ago, uh, quite a while ago. Well, yeah, 20 years ago about. Um, I'm still trying to make myself look very young. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm young with a lot of life experience. Um, I, I sang this song uh, when I was living in Ottawa, and I was far away from home, and I was living there for two years. And um, sometimes the beauty about being outside of your circle and being outside of home is that you start really reminiscing on what you love and what's so magical about the, the place that you, where you come from. And so I started thinking, you know, I'm such a proud, I'm so proud to be Inuk. I'm young and I'm so proud. And, um, and I come from such a beautiful land. And I come from really strong people. That's who we're meant to be. Like, we are on this planet because our ancestors were extremely skilled and they were like the expert survivors. And that's who we're meant to be. And so I sang this song. Um, and then a group of uh, Nunavut, Sivunik Savut students, it's a college program in Ottawa. I shared it with them and, I, and they added a verse to it. And, I, and, and they sing it every year since mm -hmm. then. And it's like their song. And I kind of wanted like this, uh, just a song to share where young people express pride for where they come from. Because we come from a beautiful place with very strong people, and we're proud to be alive. Inuit Sivunik Sangat. exciting time where we are going to open the floor up and ask for some questions from the audiences. We have two microphones um, just down at the top of the stage, so one on stage left and stage right, so folks are welcome to come on down with any questions that they might have for our amazing artists. Don't all jump up at once, the classic joke. Fantastic. I guess while folks are getting, do you have a question? No? Yeah? Yeah? Uh-huh. 
Hello, thank you so much for your for sharing your stories. Um, I'm wondering, um, as a settler Canadian, uh, you spoke a little bit, Margot, about um, allyship and working with non-Indigenous artists, and I'm just wondering uh, your thoughts, all of you, about what, um, yeah, what collaborative work and allyship looks like for you, the future picture. <laughs> Corey. <laughs> Hi, Britt. It's Britt, right? <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, I, wor I, I work with a lot of non-Indigenous people. I think that something that we, that, uh, 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 something that, I, that we do at Urban Inc. is that the people who are in the roles of power are either Indigenous or culturally diverse. So we're looking at, uh, and it's not always across the board, but we're looking to invite artists in who are conscious of why that needs to happen and of why uh, and how and how sometimes it's it's really difficult for for indigenous artists to kind of be the one person in the room who's raising a flag about something, and that it actually takes a lot of courage to stand up and to be like this feels awkward and we need to revisit it, and I'm not sure why, but that people are uh, receptive uh, to that, and also that it's not just going to be like a, a steamrolling situation. Um, and so, but what I'll also say is that now, after doing a bunch of shows, we've kind of developed a group of, of non-Indigenous artists who are like very much on board and are uh, amazing allies and who have taken the work that we've done at Urban Inc. and done that in all the different theaters that they're working in. Like an example that I'll give is uh, Julia McIsaac, who co-wrote uh, Le Fils with me and who's the associate director of Children of God, a non-Indigenous, uh, full ally, lovely human person, uh, directed a show at, in Shemanus, at the Shemanus Theater Festival, uh, like Little Women or something, like a total non-Indigenous show, cast Indigenous people in it, and did land acknowledgements and ceremony around the opening and closing with people from the local nation. So it's like, it's not just about, like, it's, it's, it's not about just doing it when it's only Indigenous shows, it's about it impacting and, and, uh, and going into every part of your practice and really living it. And so for that, that's what makes a really fantastic ally. And even when the theater company didn't want to do the land acknowledgement, uh, they did it as part of the show. Like she blocked it and wrote it into the show. Yeah. 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 I think that, um, I, I mean, we still have a ways to go. Um, but I think what the struggle is sometimes that um, our non-native uh, people and, and allies, hope, ho hopeful allies, uh, try and do it for us. And really, you need to step out of the way. You need to give up your uh, privilege, even if you think you're not privileged. You have a privilege beyond, <laughs> beyond what a lot of uh, native folk have. And, and, and you, it's just sort of a slow educational process. I think uh, mistakes have been made along the way. People's feelings get hurt. I always, um, and it's frustrating, but you know, what goes around comes around. You know, we have to still maintain a, 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 um, a conciliatory approach to working together. So you need to find ways to talk together. And if you can't, you know, if something blows up, you, can't, you know, you think it's over. Well, you know, let a few days go by. Let sleep on it. Um, learn to talk to each other, learn to share together. But sharing is really not an easy thing for any number of people to do because they're used to being in control or in power or they're, they're the director in the room, whatever. I, I think there's been a number of mistakes that have been made because people are so desperate to want to help us or do for us or work with us. It's like, well, then just relax a little and, and, and allow the leadership to come from the indigenous community and support that leadership. So. Getting out of the way, I think, is a really important thing, and it's not the for it's not easy for people who are have strong leadership themselves to step aside and and and, uh, and work with somebody else and allow them to take the leadership. I think a lot of the work that we're uh, encouraging or artists that are uh, people that want to work with indigenous artists um, have um, have you know um, best intentions, 
Um, but there is that kind of relationship that needs to grow and develop, and it, it will go through its challenges, you know, like this. So but there was somebody else mentioned uh, in a recent com conference that I was talking about um, um, some issues, and I said, you know, I was at a... I was at an event many years ago in northern BC, and the, the family were laying a headstone um, a year after the person had passed into the spirit world, and, and there was a whole ceremony around this. But one of the things they did was they had a headstone on a, on a boat, on a, a, a platform, you know, and they, were, they had ropes tied to both ends of it. And part of the family was pulling that headstone on that, on that wood platform, on that stone, like a stone boat. They would pull them forward, and then the family behind would pull back. And so that, that headstone made its way to the cemetery area like this. And so there's this tension between the past and the present and the future. And there's a tension between when you're working with people. Sometimes it, it goes forward, and then it goes back, and you're stalled. But you know, just have patience. Just, you know, that, it's part of that, that journey, that it's not, it's not straight ahead all the time. It's not smooth. It's not always easy. There's a lot of tensions there that you might not even realize are happening and, or why they're happening. But it's the, your intention. It's also your sincerity. It's also the belief that we're building relationship that we, we don't often get to do. You know, we don't often, we, we were born into our family, we have relationships and they're, you know, they're fraught with all kinds of troubles. But actually when you consciously want to build a relationship and, and spend time with the indigenous community, then you have to accept that there are gonna be times when you don't understand what's happening or you're feeling you know, like you're wanting to go somewhere really fast and you can't. Y you have to work together with everyone and that takes a little bit longer, but you know, the, 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 it's guaranteed that if you include everybody and, and keep that open conversation happening, that there will, res, um, you know, resolutions will happen and, and work will be achieved and things, everyone will be included. Um, well, I am of two worlds, so I really, um, I think that, you know, even when we talk about reconciliation, I had, I have to do reconciliation inside of myself. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm constantly gravitating towards bringing people together uh, from the Inuit community and from, um, you know, the Southern Canadian community or the the. The, the Francophone, the Quebecois community, because it's very much who I am. Uh, my father is a Quebecois, and my mom is a Inuk from Quebec, so I'm very Quebecois. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I say that when I go to Montreal, that I'm more Quebecois than you are. <laughs> but um, so I really enjoy, you know, um, and everything that I do in life, it's very much like bringing, uh, incorporating the, the two worlds that I come from. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely uh, encourage conversations. Um, it's great when people are approachable, and um, especially when the indigenous community is very approachable with the non-indigenous, and we can just remember that we're all human beings here, really, um, and that we have uh, a lot to share and a lot to learn from each other, and it's it's. It's great to see, um, I, I'm, you know, I'm in my 40s, but when I was a kid and, and I, I, there was a time I lived in Montreal, you know, there, there wasn't very much uh, conversation about Inuit, about, my, about indigenous people at all. And so I do come from that, you know, that world too, but I also, um, I also come from a world up north where, um, we are still trying to find a way of um, of bridging people together, you know. And uh, I think number one is to honor our language, though. That's really, really important. That should come first. Hi. I have 
a question to all the panelists. Like, um, I know that the First Nations, Indigenous, and Métis people, they are all very spread out across large geographical differences, um, large geographical distances. And um, for example, you mentioned that the Inuit are spread out across Greenland, Canada, Alaska, and Russia. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how do you maintain that sort of cultural connection, for example, as someone from Canada with someone from Russia, for example, with all the differences in like geography and differences in culture and as well as differences in simply like country policies? I think that's the beauty about being an artist is that we get to travel. And um, in my you know, 25 years of, of touring and, and doing all kinds of projects, it's amazing to meet up with artists from Alaska and from Greenland and Russia. And we, we're so, we live so far apart, but our language, the basic language of Inuktitut is the same. So we have the same words for, for whatever exists in nature is the same words. It's just that our, our language is modern now, you know? Spoon is a different word, and sugar is a different word, depending on where you're coming from. So it's always, um, yeah, this is how we learn about each other, is, is that we travel. And it's not, it wasn't the case 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. question. Everyone spoke a little bit about their connection to the land and to nature and how that influenced their work and so I would like to maybe hear a bit more about that or perhaps if land specifically doesn't impact your work then what other sorts of values do you carry with you into your artistic pro process? What? Well, yeah. <laughs> indicates with the lips. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, and I, I feel like it's a part of every, everything that I do. Um, I feel that I, I, uh, I, I find a lot of answers um, on, on the land and in, in the silence. Uh, but I also think that how, how it relates to actually doing the work. I spent a lot of years um, working at Caravan Farm Theatre, an outdoor like theatre on a farm. And, uh, and it's a totally... Uh, extraordinary experience as an indigenous artist because the land and the skies and the the wind the, the, the horses and birds have a character in your show and I guess you could choose not to like not to reflect that in your work but when you do it's really extraordinary and it's really something that's uh, unique in what you were talking about before of, of having it be just your work being outside and, and how that uh, almost lifts it to a, to a level that I think is very traditional to how our stories, stories were told way back in the olden days. So that's a really special thing and, and I hope it always stays there, you know? Oh, that's fantastic. And I think that's a lovely way for us to end our session today. So again, just wanna thank you all so much and thanks to Big Thinking for hosting us all today and everyone for coming out, miigwech. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just close by saying Haichka, Miigwech, Merci. You've made our hearts sing. We're really moved, we're really touched, and I want to thank uh, the sponsors who have given us this incredible opportunity to speak with you today. So Shirk, um, uh, Universities Canada, and Canada Foundation for Innovation, thank you so much. This has been incredibly moving. Um, uh, tomorrow we have our final event uh, in the Big, uh, Big Thinking series. Stan, Stan Douglas will be here at 4.30, so I invite you to join us. And then following that, we have, uh, we, there is a reception um, uh, here um, in the art gallery afterwards. So please join us if you can to continue this really important journey um, that's just incredibly moving. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.